turning them on. Hello? Do we Power have up the Millennial Falcon. <laughs> Can you guys hear us? No. Hello? No? What? Oh, check, 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 check. Oh, here okay, we go. Before, yeah. before we start answering all the very serious questions, I thought it would be good to break the ice with a little joke. So I asked Pastor Andy, and he said, yes, but keep it short. So it's a joke about the Pope. And uh, as you know, the Pope doesn't get to do anything. You know, everything gets done for him. So one day, he's really bored in his chambers, and he decides he wants to go for a ride. So he comes down, and he gets to the brand new limo that every year they have a brand new limo for him. And so he gets to that limo, and the, his chauffeur is there in his uniform, well-trimmed beard with a hat. And he goes, Your Holiness, can I do something for you? And he goes, Well, uh, yes. Uh, can I drive? And the chauffeur goes, Well, I'm, that's my job. He goes, Well, I'm bored. I'd like to drive. How do you say no to the Pope? So he goes, Okay, so you just sit in the back and let me just drive. So the Pope gets at the wheel, starts driving the car, he's having a lot of fun. He's driving and pretty soon he's speeding and sure enough, he gets stopped by the police. So the officer comes to the window and he goes, excuse me, can I have the uh, insurance and driver's license? And the Pope answered, he goes, I don't know anything about insurance and I don't have a driver's license. Because he doesn't drive ever, so he doesn't, have, he doesn't need one. So he goes, you stay here, I'll be right back. So the police officer goes back and radios his superior and he goes, um, I've got a situation here. I've got somebody driving a limo and speeding and he, he, I mean, it's, it's somebody important, I think. It's somebody very important, but he doesn't have his papers. What do you mean important? Is it like a, a senator? Oh, no, 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 no. More important than a senator. Okay, is it, is it go the governor? No, no, sir. I think, I, think, I think it's more important than a governor. What do you mean, like the, the president? No, 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 sir. I think it's even more than that. I think it's, I think it's Jesus because the Pope is driving. <laughs> Sorry. Well, let's let's close in prayer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we're moving into our Q and A part of the conference, and I, I will say, you guys, not only do you guys ask a lot of questions, this box is full, but you ask really good questions. So that's encouraging. Yes. So yes. I tried to divide. Some of, I, could, I don't think we're going to get to all of them in the time allotment, but I tried to divide them up according to expertise. All the Antichrist questions go to Jeff over here. <laughs> and so we're going to try to do these in rapid fire uh, to get as many questions in as possible. So we'll just rotate um, between the three of us. So the first question is, what is the thousand year millennium for? Why the need? Which is a wonderful question. Because it would make more sense for Jesus to come back, uh, just cast Satan into the lake of fire and start the eternal state. So why the millennium? Well, there has to be a time in history for certain prophecies to be fulfilled concerning this earth. Um, the eternal state is a new earth. So what do you do with uh, Zechariah 14, 16 through 18? Tons of passages that only fit the millennium. And one of the things to understand is that history is pedagogical, meaning that God allows eras of history to go forward to teach humanity a lesson. And the great lesson that comes out of the millennium is where man's, what's man's problem? Is humanity's problem his environment or his nature? And so you have mortals um, that begin the millennium, they repopulate the earth, and they're living in perfect conditions for a thousand years. There's no unmet human need because Jesus is ruling and reigning. And yet there's this massive rebellion at the end. So obviously we don't have an environmental problem. They're living in a perfect environment. We have a human nature problem. And that's what Christianity is all about. It's about transforming us from the inside out. It's not so much about fixing the outer environment. That will come later. But God is in the business through the new birth of giving us a new nature. And that's 
a great lesson that comes out of the thousand year kingdom. So I hope that answers a little bit. We'll go to Jeff. Okay. All right. How do you see digital currency playing into Bible prophecy? A uh, couple of things. I think one is that digital currency makes it easier to track transactions, uh, makes it easier to have control. Uh, this is not uh, something that is conspiratorial at all. Uh, just recently at a World Bank um, forum, they had an expert from the United States basically, well, she said those exact same things. We will be able to track every transaction on planet Earth mm -hmm. with 100% accuracy. So that's one part. Uh, the second thing, it will be make it easier to control people. Uh, for example, should a rogue regime such as the Antichrist regime, or even a regime before that, uh, be in charge of a certain country, they can begin to dictate what you can spend money on, what you can't spend money on. We've deemed uh, these uh, transactions to be immoral, uh, to be homophobic, or to be uh, bigoted, uh, to be uh, part of hate speech, so your money's not going to be allowed to do that. If you do it, we'll lock your account down, so they can do that kind of thing. Uh, but I think the biggest uh, reason why digital currency makes sense is that it just simply unifies the world, and that's the entire point of what the Antichrist wants to do, is to make the world one. Uh, that's why globalism is such a dangerous threat uh, to individual and national freedom. So I think that unifying the world economically is just one area. Uh, we know that in Scripture that he'll be unifying the world uh, spiritually and religiously as well uh, and militarily and that type of thing in certain areas. So I think that's the main thing. It'll just make it easier to manage, get everybody under one roof, and we're all in one big happy family called the Antichrist regime. Mm. Amen. Why do I get the hard questions? <laughs> Why does Olivier wear the thing on his head? <laughs> Good question. Uh, this is a uh, cultural thing. Jewish people, religious Jews wear the yarmulke or the kippah, which means uh, either on Hebrew or Yiddish, which is a uh, dialect of, of mixed of Hebrew and German, which means skull cap. Uh, Jewish people uh, who are religious wear this head covering because they believe that in God's presence they should cover their head out of reverence for, uh, for the Almighty. So Jewish people will cover their head. If they're very religious, orthodox, they're usually black because there's no color uh, to, to distract them. And it will be any time that they are in God's presence, which is basically except for when they sleep or when they take a shower, it will be on their head. And then you go down the orthodox, uh, conservative, reform, and, and you go down the scale, and then by the time you get to the agnostic Jews, they don't wear them at all, except if they go to a synagogue for a bar mitzvah or something, then they will wear it. But this is not really a biblical thing. I think it's more of a, it, 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 it's not that old. It's probably a few hundred years old, and it's become very a, a cultural thing. Why do I wear it? Because when I go to a church, I have heard too many times, you were Jewish, now you're a Christian, so how do you feel? And so I want people to know that I am a Jew, I just believe that Jesus is my Messiah and my Savior, but I, I have not had a transfusion when I became a Jew. And when I became a Christian, I'm still the same person, except that now I found my Messiah. So, anyway. Amen. That's good. All right. Does the sixth seal start the day of the Lord or the first seal. Um, a lot of people out there are teaching that the wrath of God doesn't start until seal judgment number six because that's the first time you see wrath, the word orge, um, in um, early revelation. So they're trying to argue that everything that happens before that is the wrath of man and the wrath of Satan, but not the wrath of God. So therefore, the church is going to be here uh, basically for the first five seal judgments or the first six seal judgments. And this is called the pre-wrath rapture of the church. Um, it's misnamed because our view is pre-wrath rapture because we think the whole tribulation period is God's wrath. Um, when you study those first five seal judgments, they're very severe. For example, a quarter of the world's population is wiped out. And Jesus in heaven, Revelation 5, is opening a seven-sealed scroll that's causing these judgments. So I don't have to see the word wrath to know that that's the wrath of the Lamb. And when you track the language in those first five seal judgments into a lot of the prophets, like Ezekiel chapter five, other places, 
it mentions those same judgments, you know, famine, warfare, pestilence. And the Old Testament will use the expression, the wrath of God. So the bottom line is the whole tribulation period is the wrath of God. And the wrath of God starts when Jesus takes the seven sealed scroll, opens it, and the rider on the white horse comes forward. That's the wrath of God, as is all the judgments. So if we are spared from the wrath of God, which the New Testament tells us we are, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 9 would be an example, we will not be here for any of the tribulation period. You will not see a millisecond of the tribulation period. So, so we're not going to be here for three quarters of it or whatever. So I hope that helps. All right. Regarding the imminence of the rapture, how do precursors play a role in that? I assume what you mean is the things we're seeing happening uh, right now. Uh, a couple of things. I think the way that the, the signs of the times that we're seeing right now, we're in the times of the signs, time, signs of the times, is that uh, they're a wake-up call to the world. I think that's one thing that it does to play a role uh, in the end times. I think, secondly, uh, it's a motivation for the bride. Uh, that, you know, it used to be in America in small towns that on Sunday mornings church bells would ring. And that was a, a little subtle way to say, get your keister out of bed and to church, you know, <laughs> kind of thing. Um, but when you heard the bells ring, you knew that church was about to begin. Uh, in our day, when you start to see the leaves turning on the trees, you know that fall is probably about to come. Or I think it was Tim LaHaye who famously said, you know, when you're in the grocery store and you hear Christmas music playing, it's not even Thanksgiving yet. Uh, you know that Thanksgiving must be close because you're already hearing Christmas music. Well, what we're hearing right now is the music of Revelation. We're hearing the overtures of Revelation. We're hearing the faint echoes of that. And we're not even at the rapture yet. So the rapture is a signless event, so we cannot ever know exactly when the rapture is going to happen. But as we're hearing the, the overtures of revelation being played, I think these precursors tell us that, the rap, that it tells us that the rapture uh, is obviously closer than ever before. And I'll just be quick to say this. Th that's the number one question that I get asked is timing of the rapture. And for me, I just simply say this is that we need to be prepared at any moment because it is an imminent event. But at the same time, you know, God wants us to continue our lives and be daily faithful to the tasks that he's called us to. You know, young marriages need to have babies and people need to date and go to work every day and mow the lawn and do the things God's called us to do. Uh, but I do believe that, that it is kind of a wake-up call to us and uh, it just reminds us that, you know, in the end times, uh, you know, there may or may not be uh, this great revival that takes place. There's actually apostasy that's prophesied, not a revival. But I do believe that God is reviving his church right now uh, through the remnant that's waking up to uh, Bible prophecy and what he's doing. So I think those precursors have that effect on the bride. And you have a book called Awake the Bride, right? I do. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and you could slip a 50, yeah, yeah. 50 to me a little later. Wake the Bride. Sorry, I was not listening. Will the rapture occur on Rosh Hashanah? Yeah. So, uh, good question. I have a video on my YouTube channel on that, on all the Feast of Israel. And uh, will the rapture... On, let me rephrase that, 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 uh, that question. Could the rapture happen on Rosh Hashanah? The answer is yes. But if it happens on Rosh Hashanah, it is not because it's Rosh Hashanah. It's just because it happens to happen on that day. Okay? We do not know when the rapture will take place. So it could happen on Rosh Hashanah, but not because it is Rosh Hashanah. That's yeah. it. Very good. All right. I get the non-controversial ones here. <laughs> Where does the Ezekiel War of Ezekiel <laughs> 38 and 39 fall on the timeline of the tribulation. Now this is, um, it's highly debated, you know, everybody up here probably won't agree completely on this, which is okay, they can go their way and I'll go his way. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> but I, I, do, I do have a book on it out there called The Middle East Meltdown, and my basic premise in it and I've been trying to teach this in the Sunday School series I've been doing here at Sugarland Bible Church called The Middle East Meltdown. I believe that chapter 38 connects with the second seal judgment because it's a movement from peace to war. As you move from seal one to seal two, Revelation six, it's peace, 
that the Antichrist brings into war in the second seal. And when you study Ezekiel 38, you'll see that exact same thing. Uh, the invasion by these powers against Israel is a time when Israel's living in security and unwalled villages, and she's in peace because she's being protected by the covenant with the Antichrist. But when this war happens, uh, that's the trajectory into war, and that's the second seal judgment. And chapter 39, I think the mistake that people make is they take chapters 38 and 39 as happening con concurrently or simultaneously. I don't see that. I see a process. Chapter 36 is a process. Chapter 37 is a process. So I think chapters 38 and 39 are a process. And so chapter 39 moves you to the end of the tribulation and it talks about the aftermath of that war. So it talks about a converted Israel, which is a end of the tribulation event. It talks about the uh, beasts or the birds of prey gorging on the corpses of the slain which is an end of the tribulation event. And so what I think is chapter 38 and 39 are, are bracketing the outer edges of the tribulation. Chapter 38 towards the beginning of the tribulation, chapter 39 towards the end. And if you want to learn all the details in between, you can't stay in Ezekiel 38 and 39. You've got to consult other areas of scripture. And so that's a, that's a, that's a new view on it. It's not original with me. I picked this up from uh, my professor at Dallas Seminary, the late Harold Honer. And I looked into his view and I thought his view made the most sense. Um, but in my book, The Middle East Meltdown, you'll see I list all seven views on the timing of this. And not everybody agrees on it, but that's my best take on that. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, what are scriptures that convince you of a pre-tribulational rapture? Uh, I would begin by talking about uh, 1 Thess uh, chapter 1 and verse 10. Uh, the context is the day of the Lord. And he says, uh, to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. And anytime, you know, you could talk about, you know, words in the Bible. Anytime you want to know what a word means, you always find out what it means in the context in which it's written. Because the same word can have several different meanings and nuances uh, considering the context. Also, at the end of, of chapter uh, 5, uh, verse, uh, verse 9, it says, for, again, the day of the Lord is the immediate context. God has not delivered us, uh, for, destined us, rather, for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So that would be another uh, clear one. And again, Paul went over and over again with the Thessalonians about the end times. And then when you get to uh, Revelation 3... And uh, the letter to the church at Philadelphia, he says, because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I will also keep you from the hour of testing, uh, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who, are in, who dwell upon the earth. Uh, that Greek phrase there, to keep you from, means to keep you completely out of. It doesn't mean to cause you to endure something through it, but to really take you out of, which, which dovetails perfectly with John 14 mm -hmm. and the marriage mo metaphor when Christ coming and snatching us away and taking us out of there. And the other thing about that verse is uh, he says that the, this hour of testing is about to come upon the whole world. Mm -hmm. uh, there's never been an hour of testing upon the whole world. Uh, and in that phrase there where he says, those who dwell upon the earth is a specific uh, Greek phrase that is used many times throughout the book of Revelation, always refers to unbelieving, uh, the unbelieving in the world. So once again, the unbelieving are to be tested, but the church is to be taken out of. And then finally, I would just say that when you look at the, how the church is portrayed, even the word church in Revelation, I think it's mentioned like 21 or 22 times in the whole book, Ecclesia, uh, 19 times is uh, chapters 2 through 3, and then when you get to the time of the tribulation, uh, chapters 6 through 19, it's not mentioned even once. Uh, in fact, the church is portrayed as being in heaven, as represented by the 24 elders in Revelation 4. We don't see the church again until chapter 19, and she's exiting heaven, coming to earth with Jesus at the second right. coming. So for those reasons, uh, I, I would say the, the pre, those are the pre-trib verses I would point to. Mm -hmm. Um, 
I'm going to, I, I'll do two, but you'll know why. Uh, why <laughs> did, because I'm special. Why did, the U why did the USA not do more to stop the Holocaust during World War II? It seems like bombing Hitler's railroads would have been doable. Why did America not help the Jews? I will cover this very question tomorrow morning as I open my, my, my message. So I'm not going to answer it now because I want everybody to get more details. So I'll just answer this one. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. How do you respond to someone that says, if the Jews are the chosen people, how can I worship a God that would allow them to be killed in the manner that they were in the Holocaust? Very good question. This is probably the most commonly asked questions from Jewish people who are not religious, who do not believe in God, either because they just don't, or they used to, but they don't anymore. Like, for instance, my mother. My mother, as you know now, Uh, saw her dad taken from in front of her eyes when she was 15, and uh, whatever she believed about God disappeared at that time. Uh, I became a believer uh, in, uh, in the mid-80s, and I started praying for my parents, and uh, when my dad was, um, was dying of cancer, I went back to France to say my goodbyes, and um, I had been praying for my parents' salvation for 28 years, and I didn't think it would be this Jewish boy leading his mom and dad to the Lord. You know, your parents, it's usually pretty hard. It's usually not you doing it. So I thought maybe somebody will. Well, I sat down with my mother uh, the morning of my return to France to, to say goodbye to my dad in the hospital. And I said, Mom, you know, dad's not coming back from the hospital. He's not going to make it. And she goes, I know. And they had been married for 63 years. And, and I said, you, 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 you really can't rely on man. You can't rely on anybody. You cannot re even rely on me because I will fail you. I will disappoint you. But God will not disappoint you. You're going to need God more than ever. And she looks at me and she goes, how can I believe in God after what he did to my father? That question again. And the Lord really gave me an answer which might not be the answer for everybody, but I think it's, it's, a, it, it's a good start. And he gave me this illustration, and really, it was the Holy Spirit really giving me this illustration. Our son lived with us at the time, and um, I said, well, Mom, if J.D. was to come back with a police officer uh, one evening, and the police officer would come and say, we, we caught your son uh, running three red lights and two stops, and we have a pretty hefty uh, fine that needs to be paid right now. So, Mr. Melnick, would you like to pay that? And I would look at the police officer, I would say, no, my son is 20, he, he, he took the driver's test, he's, he's of age, he broke the law, he's responsible, why do you want me to pay for this? And I look at my mom and I said, mom, why are you holding God responsible for what man did to other men? Mm. And for some reason, it worked. Mm. She looked at me and she said, that makes sense. And that's the day that I actually led her to the Lord. And then we went to the hospital. And five hours later, I led my dad to the Lord. The same day. So. Praise God. Amen. Okay, I, I get the non-controversial ones. Second <laughs> Thessalonians 2, verse 3. Can you explain this verse? Does this mean we will know who the Antichrist is before the rapture? So 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3 says, Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. So this relates to a controversy related to this Greek noun apostasia. And most people, unfortunately, understand this as doctrinal departure, which the word can mean in some contexts. But it doesn't fit the context here at all because he says the apostasy. And apostasy has been going on for the last 2,000 years. It's been going on ever since the Garden of Eden. So how could that be some kind of definitive sign of the end? So the truth of the matter is, and I try to explain this in a little booklet I have out there called The Falling Away, and Arnold Fruchtenbaum read it and changed his mind on it, on this verse, on account of the booklet that I wrote. So, it so obviously, I, would, I would call it more than trying then. You see, I tried to explain it. If you got Arnold to change his right. mind, you did a good job. Right. 
And so, you know, the, a lot of people are trying to discredit the booklet, but it has yeah. some credibility. Uh, I think Don Stewart changed his view or moved in the direction of the view I'm going to give here in a little bit and, and others. But the apostasy, apostasy means departure. The question is departure from what? It can be a physical departure or it can be a spiritual departure. Uh, when you look this up in the Greek lexicon, you'll see both definitions there. And I think what better makes sense contextually here is a physical departure, not a doctrinal departure. Because if you go back to verse 1, he's talking about the rapture. Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus and our gathering together to him. He's talking about the rapture. And so what Paul is saying is, well, what he's not saying is, okay, there's going to be a doctrinal departure in the church before the Antichrist comes. That's the common interpretation of this. But that's not what he's dealing with here. In fact, in the Thessalonian letters, he doesn't even warn ever about a last day's doctrinal departure. He warns about that later in his ministry. This is early in his ministry. He warns that about that later in his ministry in the, the two Timothy books and Second Peter talks about it. What he's focused on here early in his ministry is the second coming of Jesus, the rapture. And what he's saying is the Thessalonians were upset they thought they were in the tribulation. They had received a forged letter allegedly coming from Paul that the tribulation period had started. That bothered them a great deal because he had taught them earlier that they would not see the tribulation. And Paul's simple point is you're not in the tribulation period yet because the physical departure of the church hasn't happened yet. The physical departure of the church must take place first. Then the Antichrist will come. So I'm seeing verse 3 essentially as a synonym for the rapture. And what's interesting is when you go back in history and you look at English translations, they all interpreted this not as apostasy, but the departure and it's not until the Reims Bible, which is a Roman Catholic English translation, that they aim this at the Protestants. And they said the Protestants are doctrinally departing. And they changed in the English translation in the Reims Bible uh, uh, this into a doctrinal departure. And the King James translation came along and said two can play at that game. And they made the apostasy a doctrinal departure aimed at the Catholics. So what happened is our English translators on this verse got away from their work of translation and got involved into polemics. And that's why the English translations that we follow today, the NIV, the NASB, the NKJV, uh, some of you might be NIV positive, you know, for all I know. <laughs> they, they translate this as something doctrinal. But that is something new coming into English translations from the Reims English Bible. What this actually means, going back to prior English translations, is the departure of the church must happen first, which fits with a pre-tribulational understanding. And that fits with the Greek word because all that Greek word means is departure. Does it mean physical departure or does it mean spiritual departure? Context controls. And I think context here is favoring the physical departure of the church. Now, if I'm right, if we are right on this, then it's game, set, match for a pre-tribulational rapture. Absolutely. That's why people are opposing this interpretation that I'm giving because they're not pre-trib. There's nothing left to debate on the rapture because what it says is before the Antichrist comes, the physical departure of the church will come first. And that's my best take on it. I have a little booklet out there trying to explain my view on it. It's highly controversial. People 
you know, really foam at the mouth on this. <laughs> and I think the reason they're so upset about it is if we're correct on this, let's stop debating the rapture. The debate is over. Before the Antichrist comes, the church will physically depart via the rapture. Amen. All right, these are two questions that kind of overlap, so I'm going to put them both together. Um, what do you think about uh, Joel Richardson's teachings and his opinion about the Antichrist being uh, Muslim? And then the other question is, do you believe the Antichrist will be Gentile or Jewish? And some scriptures to uh, support your view. Well, I'll begin with Daniel 9.27, uh, which identifies the Antichrist as being uh, from the people of the prince who is to come. Uh, we, we know that the people who... Destroyed Jerusalem were Romans, uh, so conceivably the Antichrist would come from a revived Roman Empire. Uh, that would be presumably a Gentile. Uh, the second thing is that when we look at Revelation 13:1, we see the Antichrist rising out of the sea. It says, and uh, when we look at Revelation 17:15, we see the waters or the seas being described as the nations of the earth. Obviously, the Gentile nations as opposed to uh, the nation of Israel. So for that reason, I would put him more in the Gentile camp. Um, realize there's a difference of opinion there, but that's where I see it. The other thing, too, is that uh, for the Antichrist to be a Muslim, uh, he's not going to be a very good Muslim. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, in back to this passage here, uh, in Second Thess, it says that this Antichrist will oppose and exalt himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself to be God. Um, if you know, the very first tenet of Islam is there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. For a Muslim to exalt himself, that would, that would be the utmost blasphemy uh, in all of Islam. Um, also, it would be uh, very odd for the Jews to receive a Muslim, I think, a Muslim Messiah-like figure. I think that would be very odd especially given the tensions that we're seeing right now uh, in Israel. Uh, and then also for a, a Muslim to be in charge of the destruction of the third holiest site in Islam, uh, the, the temple and the mosque, or the, the, uh, the mosque there of Omar and the Al-Aqsa Mosque, the, the, temple, the Dome of the Rock there, that would just is unconscionable to me that a Muslim would ever take, uh, take part in that. So I, I lean towards him being a, a Gentile there. I mean, I'm certainly possible that he could be a Jew, but from the, the Daniel passage and from these other passages, it just seems more likely he's going to be a Gentile. And plus, the whole idea of the Antichrist, he represents a Gentile kingdom. So he's not representing a, an Islamic kingdom or a Jewish kingdom. He's representing a whole Gentile kingdom. So. Yeah. Well, haven't we, the Jews, done enough against the world that, you know, on top of that... Now they get blamed for the Antichrist, yeah, right? Yeah, really? Yeah. Seriously? Gosh. Can't so, catch a break. <laughs> Just can't catch a break. <laughs> um, okay. There seems to be a large movement of Gentile believers leading, uh, leading and or joining the Messianic movement, focusing on Old Testament Mosaic law. Any comments or advice? Um, there is a, um, how do I go about this? Um, caref yeah, carefully. Um, I, I believe beyond the shadow of a doubt that we are under grace uh, from Scripture. And uh, the Messianic movement is, is not a, a fad. There's not something that's going to go away, actually. When you look at the first, uh, the first century church, it was pretty much the Messianic movement before we had one. Uh, and so the, the Messianic movement is, is a valid thing. It's a valid movement. The problem is that in every denomination, every movement, you've got abuses. You've got extremes. And so you can find people, uh, like you can find anywhere from... Gentiles who are very Torah observant all the way down to Jews who are completely assimilated within the body of Messiah and within the Messianic movement. Oh, they, they cut me off. Is, are we, is this YouTube or? Okay. Yeah, right. and, and so, so and, and that's okay. We're under grace. If, if, if a Gentile or a Jew want to keep some of the Mosaic law because they feel like this is something you want to do, they're convicted to do so, I have no problem with that. I have friends in this room. 
I was not going to name them by name. We have different views. We're two Jews who think differently on, on the Torah. Uh, we, we both agree it's the Word of God. But my, my point is, under grace, we have liberty. We have freedom to do or not do according to our convictions. What we cannot do is tell the other side, you should or should not based on what I do. If I want to keep kosher and I tell somebody you should, that's wrong. If I, don't, if I want to not keep kosher and say to somebody you should not keep kosher under grace, that's wrong too. It's everybody's choice under their own convic conviction as believers. Now, one more side note, because maybe this person was talking about what is known as the Hebrew Roots Movement, which is another movement which I am, don't agree. I don't think it's biblical. This is a larger movement within uh, evangelicalism where uh, believers, Gentile believers, believe that once they become believers, they are grafted in ethnically into Israel and they become Jews. I, have n I don't find any scripture to validate that, and that's actually a dangerous heresy, I think. So if that's what you were asking in that question, there's your answer. All right. Now, since you guys did two questions, I get to do two. Do the Jew first. Yes. <laughs> so here's my question my wife told me she slipped a question in and I think I found it why is Andy so handsome <laughs> oh that was me I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't think you'd read it I'm, I'm really sorry so I recognize her handwriting. In fact, Anne, can you stand up? Yes, stand up, stand Over up. Over there, stand, stand up. up. <laughs> See, that's what she does. She gets it recognized. Yeah. A, lot of, a lot of you have said, we love pastor's point of view. And let me explain why we have it. It's because of her. She does all the... Pastor Jim and myself just sit in front of microphones and talk, but she puts up all the images and she just does a great job. So, all right, back to the word of God here. <laughs> um, when Joshua brought the Jews into the promised land, did they occupy the entire promised land or will that wait until the millennium? That's a great question. Um, when you look at Joshua eleven twenty three. It says, so Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord had promised to Moses. And so the reformed camp replacement theology jumps on a verse like that. And they'll say, look, the land promises given to Abraham in the Abrahamic covenant have been satisfied in the days of Joshua. Nothing to see here, folks. Move right along. There's not going to be a future kingdom when God is going to fulfill the land promises in the millennium. Well, the last time I looked, Joshua 11 comes before Joshua 13. Amen? And when you look at Joshua 13, it says, Now Joshua was old and advanced in years. When the Lord said, you are old and advanced in years. I hope when I get old and advanced in years, the Lord doesn't repeat that I'm old and advanced in years. And it says here, and very much of the land remains to be possessed. And it goes on in these verses and it talks about what the Philistines had, what the Gershurites had, etc. When you go to Joshua 21, it, there's the same thing going on. Uh, Joshua 21, I think it's verse 43, gives the intimation at first glance that Israel get, captured all of the land in the days of Joshua. It says, so the Lord gave Israel all the land which he had sworn to their fathers. Well, Joshua 21 is followed by Judges chapter 1, a couple chapters later. And Judges 1 mentions all the land they had yet to capture. So it's, this is an example of people taking verses out of context. You can make the Bible say whatever you want it to say if you don't care about the context. You know, Judas went out and hung himself. Go thou and do likewise. And what you do, do quickly. Mm -hmm. 
So I've strung three verses together to make it support suicide when the Bible doesn't support that. And so when you just put these verses in context, you see that the Joshua generation did not gain all of the land. In fact, they only gained a sliver of everything that was promised. And this is true into the Solomonic era. Uh, when you look at 1 Kings 4.21, Solomon didn't gain all of the land. He gained a lot of it, but not all of it. And, for example, it talks about how Solomon gained the land to the border of Egypt. 1 Kings 4.21. The devil's in the details, isn't it? Because Abraham was promised territory not to the border of Egypt, but to the river of Egypt. So Solomonic reign, close but no cigar. Conquest of Joshua, close but no cigar. And God cannot lie. So Israel has never captured the territory completely that was promised to Abraham. So there has to be a future time in history when this happens, and we believe it awaits the millennial kingdom. That's why the prophets like Amos, after the days of Joshua, after the days of Solomon, reiterated the land promises. So the land promises have never been completely fulfilled, and that pushes us forward to a future earthly reign of Jesus. All right, this uh, question says, why was Revelation written, quote, for the church if we won't be here to experience it? That's a great question, by the way. Uh, I would begin by saying uh, that the same question applies to most all of the Old Testament prophets as well, and here's why. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10 says, as to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful search and inquiry seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, the people who would experience the prophecies. And these things which have now been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you uh, by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. So you think about all the Old Testament prophets that never saw their prophecies come true. Uh, they prophesied for our benefit. And now John in Revelation and, and in Daniel have, have prophesied uh, primarily for those who are going to experience these prophecies uh, in Revelation during the tribulation uh, in the saints during that time. So that would be the first thing is that the Old Testament prophets didn't experience it either. The second thing I would say that Revelation is written, it says written in verse 4, to the seven churches. So obviously the book of Revelation is written to the church, not to the world but to the church. And so uh, these, church, these saints in the tribulation period and the Jews in the tribulation period will certainly be able to apply. And that's, in fact, that's what Revelation 13 tells us to do is, is let him who has wisdom figure out who the Antichrist is through the, the number of his name uh, or the number of his name or, or his name. And so uh, it's for their benefit. But you back it up just a little bit that Revelation is not just written for, uh, as I said today, to give us uh, a heads up on history in advance. It is for that, so that we can know what's going to happen. We can have discernment in the times in which we live. But the last thing I would say is simply this, is that when you think about why Revelation was really written, mm -hmm. it was really written to tell us who God is. I mean, that's the main reason. Uh, the very first verse in Revelation mm -hmm. is the clue to the whole book. It says, the revelation of Jesus Christ. So the whole book of Revelation... In fact, I'm writing a book right now about this very topic, how the entire book of Revelation basically just exalts God, reveals who God is. His attributes come screaming out of the pages of the book of Revelation. And uh, sometimes that gets lost when you're talking about the beast and the Antichrist, all these other things, you know. But it's, the Revelation really is a book about God. It's a book about Jesus. He's the main character. Uh, he drives the entire narrative. So I would say that would be the main reason he wrote uh, this, this prophetic book, so that we could know who our God is uh, before we go, come to meet him at the rapture. Thank you. Thank you.
Romans 11, uh, and it's actually Romans 11, 25, 26, all Israel will be saved. Does this apply to the remnant alive at the end of the tribulation, or is it retroactive? Very good question. Um, uh, I believe that uh, from, from what we learn from Scripture, that uh, because a lot of people come to me and they say, why bother the Jewish people with, with you know, with evangelism and, 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 and Jesus when all Israel will be saved? But I think here in the context, it's speaking of the end of the tribulation as we, we've covered today, the end of the tribulation when all Israel corporately will look up and, you know, Zechariah 12.10, look up on the one who they have pierced and say, Baruch haba Bashem Adonai, blessed is you who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus himself said that in Matthew, I will, you Surely you will not see me again until you say, blessed is you who comes in the name of the Lord. And that's when Israel calls him. So at the end of the tribulation, all the surviving Jewish people will say that. And they will instantly really become the Israel of God of Galatians 6.16. They will become the, the all Israel that will be saved. But that is not retroactive. Anybody between, uh, until then I should say, until then who's Jewish and dies Re rejecting Jesus, rejecting the gospel will not be part of that remnant, will not be part of the Israel that will be saved. That is why it is so critical, and there'll be more on that tomorrow morning, to double our efforts to share the gospel with Jewish people today. All right, we're getting ready for our Grand Slams. Last, last round of questions, right. so pick your okay. pick most, the final most one. explosive question you can. All right. The one that I got is, is Matthew 24, 40 through 41, the rapture or the second advent? Matthew 24, 40 through 41 says, then, there, then two men will be in the field. One will be taken, one will be left. Two women will, uh, two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Now, I came of age um, as a Christian reading um, Hal Lindsey's wonderful book, uh, the late great planet Earth, and he used this as a rapture passage. So if it's in the late great planet Earth, it's got to be true, right? It sure looks like the rapture until you put the verse in its context. And you see that the Lord is using the days of Noah as an analogy. Because if you back up in the passage... It says, for in, those, uh, for in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and given in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark, until they did not understand and the flood came and took them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. So when you read verse 39 first, you see being taken is a bad thing. The rapture being taken is a good thing. So I do not think that this is speaking of the rapture of the church. This is talking about when the Lord returns at the end of the tribulation period, there are going to be believing mortals and unbelieving mortals. Believing Jews and unbelieving Jews. Unbelieving Jews will be taken off the earth just like the floodwaters took unbelievers away will be taken off the earth into Hades and believers will be left behind to enter the kingdom. So when the, when the rapture happens and if you're taken, is that a good thing? That's a good thing. If you're left behind, is that a bad thing? Yes, yes that's a bad thing. This is the opposite. Uh, when you're taken here, it's bad. When you're left behind here at the end of the tribulation period, that's good. Because those are, that are taken are taken away into, into judgment. And so, you, you know, to read the rapture into this is just to ignore the context. In fact, Matthew 24 and 25, and I, I've done, and many of you have given me some really nice comments on it. 75 lessons on the rapture of the church. Um, here at Sugarland Bible Church. Why we, so short? <laughs> and we spent, I don't know, 10 lessons or so just talking about the Olivet Discourse where this passage is found and how the Olivet Discourse has nothing to do with the church. Uh, in fact, if you look at verse 15, doesn't verse 15 come before verse 40? It said, well, let's go down to verse 20, but pray that your flight will not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. I mean, that looks sort of um, Jewish to me. Mm -hmm. 
Verse 16 says, then those who are in Houston must flee to the mountains. Whoops. It says those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. So he's giving instructions to Israel in the tribulation period itself. And you can't just willy-nilly leave that context and turn this into the rapture because there's some verses in here that kind of sound like the rapture. I mean, it just doesn't fit the context. And so... Uh, all of that being said is I don't think Matthew 24 or 25 is dealing with the rapture. By the way, I've already gone out of the limb. I might as well keep going here. The, everybody wants to know about the um, bridesmaids, uh, those that don't have the oil trimmed and so forth. And they want to turn that into the church. And they want to say, if you're not living holy for Jesus, then he's not going to take you at the rapture. And the truth of the matter is this is dealing with a division between believing and unbelieving Israel at the end of the tribulation period. Uh, Those that have their lampstands properly trimmed are believing Jews. Those that are not are unbelieving Jews. And by the way, if we're bridesmaids, we just got demoted. Do you realize that? We're not bridesmaids. We're the the bride of Christ. So once you get the church out of Matthew 24 and 25, it's going to free your mind of so much confusion um, concerning the rapture. And very sadly, many, many people in our camp that are pre-trib, people that you know, aggressively trumpet this, pardon the expression there, aggressively trumpet this church in Matthew 24 and 25 and in so doing by not rightly dividing they're throwing countless Christians that I've counseled into confusion and so we're big here on rightly dividing God's word Mm, amen reminds me of that phrase I can do all things through a verse taken out of context I have a cup out there it says that (laughs) That that is so true wow Okay, uh, last question here uh, for me. What would you consider the top uh, three biblical arguments against um, amillennialism? Uh, I would say that, first of all, that amil- an amillennialist uh, viewpoint forces you into an illegitimate hermeneutic. You might explain what an amillennialist is. Oh, okay. They yeah. may not know. Yeah. And uh, amillennialism <laughs> just says that there is a meaning no. There is no real millennial kingdom. It's just spiritual, and it's happening right now. Christ is uh, reigning over the earth right now. Uh, so the idea of the hermeneutic or, or a way you interpret Scripture, you're forced to interpret all of Revelation symbolically. In other words, you look at it from a metaphorical standpoint. It's just good versus evil. It becomes Star Wars, basically. You know, it's the, good, it's the force versus, you know, the dark side and all this stuff. And you begin to, to, to try and it's extract meaning from all these symbols that you find in Revelation. Well, if that's true then seriously, it's anybody's guess as to what Revelation means. Because there is no little template that we lay over Revelation that says, well, well, this symbol always means this, and you can always interpret this this way. So the best way is to just let the Bible speak plainly and let it say what it's saying. And again, if the plain sense makes sense, seek no other sense lest you end up with nonsense. So, so I would just say, first of all, is that the amillennialist mistake is that they interpret the Bible symbolically and not literally. And that's a, that's a ground-level, basic interpret, interpretive principle. The second thing uh, is that if that's true, if amillennialism is true, the kingdom of God is not working very well right now. Uh, Jesus is apparently not ruling with a rod of iron. Not doing a good job. He's not doing a good job not, you know, with justice, which he claims to do during his kingdom time. Uh, we're not living to be a hundred you know, type thing. Uh, so it's just apparently not happening. Okay, So that's the second reason. The third reason is Satan is not bound. Which scripture clearly says, and if he is bound, he's on a really, really long leash right now. <laughs> you know, uh, Scripture says he's bound for a thousand years with a great chain. Either he is or he isn't. And many times, you know, I'll, I'll hear Christians talk about, uh, Satan, I bind you in the name of Jesus Christ. Well, there's only one time the Bible ever says Satan is bound. And that's during the millennial kingdom. 
Uh, it's the only time he gets changed. So the amillennialist, again, the mistake he makes is thinking that Satan is somehow bound during this age that we're living in. So those three reasons, just a bad hermeneutic, uh, Jesus is not reigning in the way that he's going to in the millennial kingdom, and Satan is certainly not bound. I said those are three, I think, huge flaws in that view. And that, that's the dominant view of Christendom going back mm -hmm. to the fourth century, yeah. believe yeah. it or not. Yeah. Take us home, brother. Is it the final question? Yep. Mm -hmm. Why does Olivia wear this hat on it? No. <laughs> I did that one already, right? If a non-ethnic Jew or converted to Judaism person believes in Christ, are they still considered Jewish? Why not just a Christian? There's actually many, uh, several questions in this, uh, in this question. Uh, I think there's a lot of confusion uh, on both sides of uh, uh, Gentiles and Jews about the de definition of who's a Jew. And that's where the problem is. And there's a, there's a difference between two things. It's Judaism and Jewishness. Once you understand that, being Jewish or being a Gentile or Christian, doesn't matter. Once you understand the two, the difference between the two, it's really helpful. Judaism is something that is practiced, followed, obeyed to. It's, you know, uh, but J Jewishness is, is an ethnic state. I was born of Jewish parents. The Jewishness is in my blood. I don't have to practice Judaism to be a Jew. The proof is that you've got Jews who practice Buddhism, Jews who practice Hinduism, Jews who practice nothing, the vast majority, uh, Jew who practice uh, trans transcendental meditation, anything but Jesus. Because, again, going back to Satan wants us to be away from Jesus. Uh, but uh, so a, a person who converts to Judaism, like Ruth, remains a Gentile who put themselves under the authority or the commonwealth of Israel or the authority of the Mosaic law. Mm -hmm. So they remain a Gentile. That, that's, that's what I think. I mean, that's my, my opinion, okay? I mean, maybe people might have a different, uh, different opinion. They're a Gentile who converted to Judaism and are practicing Judaism. So a Jew who does not practice Judaism remains a Jew to the moment of their death. A Gentile practicing Judaism is a proselyte to Judaism, is a Gentile who practices Judaism. Mm -hmm. And so Jewishness is in the blood. Judaism is something that is practiced. So the, uh, if, if, a, if a Gentile converts to Judaism, they're not really becoming Jewish. This is not a bad thing, okay? This is not a bad thing. And I'll finish with that. I have people uh, coming to me, not, not so much lately, but uh, over the 35 years of ministry I've been in, and people come to you and they go like, oh, you're Jewish? That is so wonderful. I, I, I want to be Jewish so bad. And I have looked at people back and, 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 and look at them and, and, and I try not to be, you know me, I can be very uh, sarcastic, it's my middle name. Uh, <laughs> and I look at them and I say, do you, th do you think that when God created you, he made a mistake? Hmm. God doesn't make mistakes. He made me a male, he made you a female, he made you a Gentile, he made me a Jew. God doesn't make mistakes. And don't you throw that verse about no more Jew, no more Gentile at me, because that's just talking about justification as sinners. In the body of Messiah, I'm still a Jew, he's still a tall Gentile, and there are women and men. So anyway, that's more than they ask for. Yeah. And I want to go on record saying I'm very pro-woman. In fact, I'm so pro-woman, I married one. But, 39 uh, <laughs> years for me. <laughs> Amen. Well, you guys uh, have been just a delightful yeah. congregation. Thank you for that. And as much as you guys have told us that we've encouraged you, you guys, I think I can speak for all of us, have encouraged us. So we've had a great day, wouldn't you say? Let's give the Lord a hand. And before we uh, close in a word of prayer, I just want to let you know that we're not done yet. We've got two sessions tomorrow. You get to hear both from Olivier and Jeff tomorrow here at Sugarland Bible Church. And we're going to be starting tomorrow with praise and worship at 930. Now, I've told our folks at Sugarland Bible Church that we're starting at 930. Most of them will not have listened to me 
because they're used to coming at 945. So they will be shut out of the wedding feast (laughs) where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. (laughs) So we're starting tomorrow at 930 and it's going to be get get a good night's sleep because we're going to have a great time tomorrow. And Brother Jeff, on your birthday, I'm going to ask you to close us in a word of prayer if you could. Thank you. Let's do that. Father, you are good. You give us good gifts like today. Lord, being able to sit under teaching, being able to be with like-minded believers, being able to come together, and being unified under the truth uh, is such a joyous thing, and we love you for it. Thank you, Lord, that you not only have called us to yourself and given us so great a salvation, uh, but Lord, we get to walk with you daily. We can depend upon the power of your Holy Spirit, and Lord, we have, no matter what the world throws at us, we have the brightest future of anyone on planet earth. Uh, Thank you, Jesus, that you are preparing that place for us right now. And someday, perhaps even soon, you're going to blow that trumpet and you're going to bring us home. And we love you for it. Thank you again for today. Give us a good night's sleep tonight. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Drive safely. See you in the morning. Yes, sir.